opera. Okay, mm -hmm. and this is a smaller scale opera. Usually the, uh, the, um, the story, the plot uh, is about the uh, love and, uh, you know, and about the lyrical collisions about this. Uh, and obviously with the happy end, uh, but in Jacques Offenbach, it was a little bit different, different shift, which I um, am going to tell you uh, in, in operatus. And he is, and I consider him and many critics consider him as a father of the contemporary operetta. If I might uh, be able to uh, just interject here for a second, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation here, a little bit different than, than last week. I'm going to ask you a little bit about the period this uh, phenomenal man, Offenbach, Jacques Offenbach, lived. Can you tell us about the Romantic period a little bit in uh, Romantic period in uh, music? Yes. So uh, it's a uh, Romantic period. It's, uh, it's uh, basically 19th century. That's where uh, Jacques Offenbach uh, uh, lived. When so 1819 mm -hmm. till 1880, so it's uh, the, the big chunk of the 19th century. Um, so that was the period of the romantic uh, music, which replaced the classical music, the music of 18th century. So the music of the 19th century, 19 approximately 19, uh, 1825 till 1900, it's a romantic period of music. So the music, whereas the, you have this, uh, uh, the, the center of attention is the human, the humans, uh, his or her feelings, uh, worries, the collisions in between people. And obviously one of the features is the program music, music which had program and it's not only operas and operettas it's symphonies and other genres which have programs so written after some you know mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. poetical or the uh, some some literature after mm -hmm. this uh, tell us tell so, us a little bit about his upbringing about his musical background where is he coming from so jacques offenbach is a german born french composer cellist and impresario of the romantic period. Many historians call him as, this, as the father of operetta, yes, and the light musical comedy. Uh, he was born as a Jacob, yes, in a Jewish family. His father was a, a cantor in a synagogue. And uh, obviously he, he not only cantor, he was, he was a good, violinist. He was well known in his, uh, you know, a good violinist. So his father was his first teacher. And, and uh, obviously, uh, this, uh, he was a powerful influence on later composers in his this genre. Uh, like uh, Johann Strauss or Arthur Sullivan, mm -hmm. uh, many of his operettas uh, continue to be a standard in the 21st century as well as the tales of Hoffman, the only opera he wrote. Uh, Obviously, so, the first thing the first thing you think of uh, of Offenbach is the tales of Hoffman. At least that's what comes yes, to my mind. Yes, that's what I, I I was going to ask people, but uh, you know, people, you can you can say this. You know about tales of Hoffman, but I'm pretty sure that you know, if not the uh, names of the operettas, you know some melodies from his. Uh, his sure. music, and, and we will just, I, I will prove it that you know it, okay? That you know, it's everybody <laughs> knows, okay? You may even don't, uh, okay, you know the Barcarolle probably from Tales of Hoffman. Of course. But, but, you, uh, uh, but you definitely know the Can Can, Can Can from, from the, uh, you know, uh, from the um, uh, Orphe, uh, Orphe uh, uh, in the Underworld. Uh, that's an, uh, this one of the operators. So, let's hear. Let's hear some music. Uh, can you can you give us uh, a sample from? Uh, uh, yeah, we can. We can hear the music maybe a little bit later. Or, or you want me oh. to to do this later a little bit? Okay. Okay. So it so this his education uh, was it so boy he educated his uh, cello teacher because he in two years uh, was around uh, nine year old he changed his instrument, uh, uh, violin, because the uh, father uh, taught him to cello. And he was the, uh, uh, was studied with a well-known cellist 
in his uh, town, this Bernard uh, Bru uh, Bru Brower, Brower. In three years, Jacob with his brother, Julius, vi uh, on the violin and sister Isabel on piano played a trio at local cafes, dance halls, performing some popular music. At the age of 14, Offenbach was admitted to Paris Conservatory along with his brother Julius. Obviously, that were collision. Uh, different, a different story about this. Uh, the you think Paris it was like a party school? Too much partying, yeah? Yes, yes, absolutely. And and this, the Jacob, you know that Jacob was uh, not very. Uh, I would say first of all, he was fourteen, and they accepted students from fifteen year old. Second of all, that's a limit of Jewish people there were, and, and the, you know this in, in conservatory. So his father was very persistent, and he uh, persisted that the uh, Carabini, the, the, uh, the head, the director of this conservatoire, uh, Paris Conservatoire, uh, just listened to him uh, personally. And, and uh, really he was impressed, this uh, Carabini, and Jacob was ex uh, accepted to the conservative. So he and his brother Julius. So Julius was very, very uh, uh, good student, very academically uh, good, and he just, he studied well. Uh, but, J uh, but Jacob wasn't like that. He just, he hated this, this study, this routine. So his behavior wasn't uh, <laughs> best. So in one year, he was uh, he was freed, he, he quit, he left conservatory after one year and he was freed from uh, Carabini's strict uh, cur uh, curriculum, but he was also free to starve. Uh, uh, yes, to starve because he didn't have any, uh, anything to, uh, to live on. So he started to look for jobs and this approximately this time he changes his name to, uh, to Jacques in French way. So he becomes Jack, uh, Jacques. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to. I want to mention that he he sounded very much like a like a rebel, you know, as a teenager, going against uh, you know his teachers in the Conservatoire in, in Paris. But you know, reading a little bit about him, I, I understand that actually follow this this kind of a sarcastic, cynical, and and rebel at the same time character it kind of followed him through his whole life yes absolutely absolutely and then see if this didn't help him in in his life because the people uh, were pretty mad at him at him especially when when he was young okay and he wasn't famous and uh, on the other hand it helped him in, in writing his uh, future operatus <clears throat> which i will just uh, talk ahead so just so everyone understands, he, I, I wanted to mention one thing, like he came out of school and then he, he self-taught uh, he, himself, yes, music, uh, his, his compositions and arrangements, that was all by himself. Yes, and, and, he, study and then he went completely against the music business, the, mu the field of music. And uh, I understand from you, Alexander, that those days the theater owners... The opera owners were the ones who were running the show, literally. Absolutely, they just made well, uh, made it made rules, rules, specific rules how you have to behave, what you're supposed to write, which which piece uh, to be accepted to this. So first of all, that's why he he uh, for making a living, uh, he started uh, Offenbach started the job. He was accepted uh, to uh, to be a cellist in the orchestra of the Opera Comique in France. But he always made this, uh, he continues his uh, non-serious approach as the uh, as in conservatoire, playing pranks during performances. Like he, he, he could steal the, the stand, music stand from, the, uh, you know, the, at the time of performance so that the musician didn't know where he is or she is, okay? He could even make all type of jokes. So you understand this, is, it wasn't very well behaved, okay? But this job allowed him to study with the great cellist, Louis Nordwin, and composer and conductor uh, Halevi, who, who taught him composition. So he studied 
privately. Offenbach composes a series of works for piano and cello, but he dreams to compose for the theater. So far, he built a reputation composing for and playing in the fashionable salons of, of, of Paris. He also went on numerous tours of France, Germany, and England as a cellist, and often as a virtuoso cellist, by the way. Offenbach, met, and he met many great musicians, including Anton Rubinstein, Ferenc Liszt, uh, uh, Felix Mendelssohn, and others. Around the same time, Offenbach fell in love with 17-year-old Hermine Delcain. <laughs> Uh, that was, you know, that's very difficult, but a different, you see, a different religion did not give them chance to get married. So Offenbach converted to Roman Catholicism. His father's reaction remained unknown, but you can imagine what it was. Okay, so I, I don't think it was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. His father, uh, yes. So it was a happy marriage by uh, despite some extramarital activities of Offenbach part. He gradually shifted from cellist who composed to composer who plays cello. Offenbach performs and, uh, and, and produces musical uh, burlesques as part of his salon presentation. Returning uh, 1848, he returned to Paris and Offenbach found the Grand Salon closed down. He again works as a cellist and occasional conductor at Opera Comique. Soon he became a musical director of the theater. Uh, of the theater. He composes uh, some incidental music. So talking about him, that's uh, maybe the time uh, one of the rare time when he composes incidental music, just like uh, some songs, and other uh, pieces like a cello uh, pieces for cello. One of them is a cello solo and orchestra mm. in 17th century style, which became a very, very uh, well known as the as, as common repertoire for the cellist. So he he actually kind of tries very hard to 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 get into that musical society of Paris and to to receive contracts and to receive opportunities for him to, to present his own music, but he can't. Yes, he can't because he's a Jew. Over and over. Yes. So he can't because he, he's a Jew, so he's marrying out of faith. But then I understand he he's renting his own theater and decides he's going to just run his own show. He's not going to wait for anyone. Again, a rebel, someone going against yes, the music not industry. Not even about his nationality, but his personality. Personality. He, made, he mocked <laughs> Many people, he, he didn't he didn't keep quiet, you know. That's a cut cut in the politics. How how you behave with with the with management? So yeah. management didn't give him any any commission. So in 1853 to 56, Offenbach wrote three one act operettas and managed to stage them at in Paris, but not in Opera Comique. They were staged in the theater, the Bouffe Parisienne with great success and he beca became uh, popular, especially especially the, uh, one of them is the two blind men uh, uh, from Toledo, to mm -hmm. the two blind men of Toledo, okay? That is, you know, that uh, this operetta is taken by Offenbach to Sally uh, uh, Choazel, uh, Choazel. Yes, Chauzel, I think it's okay. It's a big, big theater that became his winter residence. So uh, this two blind men of, of the leader, that's about the two beggars who pretend to be blind and they beggar, you know, they, they, they beg some money. So it's already here, this, this a, little, a little irony here and satire, okay? Which uh, then we will talk about the operetta, usually operetta in, in, in the, the further uh, times, it's more lyrical about love, about the, you know, here it's, it's a satire and, and, and specifically ironic here, it's yet just begin. Okay, and another opera at the Bataclan, it's a satire on a grand opera. That's a special satire on a grand opera, uh, it's a opera at the Bataclan. 
since the law in France required to limit musical theater works to one act, uh, so musical theater works, so it means this operettas and small this musical dramas to one act, Offenbach composed only one act operettas. But when the law changed in 1858, Offenbach began to write full-scale works beginning with the Orpheus and the Underworld. This is Let me one, interrupt this. One, one little question here, because some of our uh, listeners might not understand the difference. Yes. Can you clarify for us the difference, uh, the, tech the te technical difference between an opera and an operetta? Okay, so it's a few differences. First of all, operetta, you see this even by word, you know that this is a smaller scale opera. Number two, it's lighter in character. Lighter means it's not the collision like, like it's, you know, like a drama, big drama of opera. It's either the lyrical or in case of, of Offenbach, it's satire, it's something set, you know, completely opposite. When he writes this, for example, Orpheus in the underworld, it's, it seems like this is uh, what? It's about the, the myth. Serious. Yes, for a long time, no. It's, it's a very, very contemporary to him and it just, it's a satire, okay? It's a, you know, it's a, it's a great satire. But is there anything the about the music, about the singing? The music and the... is lighter, more, uh, more melodical. Music is absolutely lighter. And main thing, it's a happy end. It's always happy end. Operetta, it's a happy end. So it wasn't discovered in Hollywood, you're yes, telling us. Yes, 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 yes. And operettas, it's a, it's a different, yes. So in, in case of, so, so what did uh, Offenbach uh, do? So with operettas, he just uh, made, uh, uh, he, he, were, he was mocking different, different uh, uh, mm. aspects of society, like, uh, like militarism like uh, you know uh, about, about yes the kings and all of this uh, the big big opera grand opera so he just mocked uh, almost everything so satire on this okay and so, also and also his colleagues uh, composer colleagues from uh, his, his generation colleagues, yes that was, it wasn't the same the same uh, reception because uh, uh, <laughs> for example least and, and or the uh, mayor beer they, they, they okay. They were okay with this, uh, you know. Uh, they understood the humor. Uh, yes, they understood humor. But this, for example, Wagner or Berlioz, they didn't, and they were very, you know, kind of upset Pretty. with this. And, and specifically, Wagner just wrote a lot of uh, different articles about, uh, uh, you know, about this, you know, and especially in the jewelry and in, in music. Okay, his famous uh, article. Let's listen uh, to some music, Alexander. Jewelry, yes. Yes, so I will give this one music from the, uh, uh, from the, just one second, to share this from this Orpheus and Underworld. Okay, mm. so this will be the uh, Orpheus and Underworld and that will be uh, Overture. And uh, before we go to this, I will just share this, yes, with you, okay. Before we go to this, I have to tell why I'm just pick the uh, um, this uh, a little bit of uh, overture because in overture, that's the characteristic for Offenbach as well for uh, for other composers. This, but Offenbach specifically, he puts the main melody and overture mel main melodies of his operettas. He puts an overture just as a compilation of uh, different <laughs> melodies which sound later in overture. Listen to this.
<laughs> a lot of humor in his music, a lot of satire, it's just lighter music. <laughs> I would like to, to give you a little bit of the music, what you know. He combines variety of styles. <clears throat> Let's try something. Yes, very lyrical, yes, the part. And then I will just give you this. Picked up. Listen, you will never hear this in an opera.
You see it? Okay, tell me, tell me who doesn't know this music. So this music you see immediately shows you what operetta is and this from this can can so called because the dance called can can, yes, which came from varieté, the French cafes, yes, special, yes, brought to the stage. The first by Offenbach, and this is his famous can can. And yeah. just remember this, and this uh, genre came to life. And then the, it became uh, uh, this uh, very important part of each operetta of different composers. That Rossini, who uh, actually was friend with uh, Offenbach, Rossini called him Mozart. Mozart of the Champs-Élysées. Champs Mm. Yes. In 1856, this is important, Offenbach writes a long article in Le Figaro where he explores the, the, the paper, yes? He explores history of music comedy and describes or proclaims main features of this genre. So uh, this, opera, this operetta has a great success. And in 1859, Offenbach writes the operetta Genevieve of Brabant. This operetta wasn't, uh, a uh, didn't have a big success, but one number you definitely supposed to recognize, to recognize, to know, let me share the screen with you. And that's the uh, duet of two gendarmes. And you know what it become? Eventually it was reworked as the US Marine hymn with different lyrics, obviously. Okay, so I will just give this this to you. I think is this one. Yes. <laughs> Have you heard this? So you recognize this music, huh? Next time you will know that this is music by Alton Buffy. I'll give you uh, give you just an example because I need to, to give you more uh, examples of this uh, of things. Okay, so I will share with you uh, uh, next time. See the stop sharing here. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, so eighteen uh, sixties were Offenbach's most successful decade. He became a, a French citizen, and he uh, and he writes. First of all, he writes his only ballet. Only one ballet he has, the Le Papillon, which is the butterfly. Uh, although he wrote less frequently, but more of his works premiered at, at larger theaters. Okay, just a little bit from his ballet here. You will hear this, this beautiful music, his lyrical abilities uh, of the uh, song uh, of, the, uh, of his, what he's writing, okay? So it's Walzer from the Papillon. And you recognize Venice. Is this Plaza? Some beautiful pictures and beautiful walls.
Okay, so let me let me just ask you, please. What this waltz? Uh, what's the music just reminds you? Okay, so and then uh, we just let's talk about this. Okay, so uh, it between eighteen sixty four and eighteen sixty eight, Offenbach wrote four operettas, which really made him famous, and just he regarded for those operettas in years and centuries to come. So the first one is, up, is, is uh, La Belle Helen, the beautiful Helen, 1864. It's, it's a very, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful operetta, which is, uh, uh, yes, is an opera buffa in three acts. Actually, he, wrote, he uh, usually he named opera buffa. Booth, which is the same thing. It's a parody on the story of Helen's elopement with Paris, with Paris at the time of Trojan War. And if you think that this is Trojan, uh, it's a time of the of the very ancient time. No, he again he brings this to the contemporary stage, contemporary uh, scenery. So eventually, great success and popularity, influenced by Viennese waltzes. A lot of funny situations in this operetta. Just, I give you just a little bit of, of this taste, if you don't mind, just again. Can I uh, ask you his uh, Strauss? Strauss, he knew Strauss, yes, he so, met so him. That's, that's why, yes, yes. That's so why do you think is, Strauss had an influence on him or vice yes, versa? The Strauss one, the Strauss one, and then Strauss two, this, uh, who wrote this, the, the famous uh, uh, Blue Daniel Waltz and, and which uh, Bram, everyone uh, drums. The, um, <laughs> Offenbach said, Offenbach said that it's a beautiful music. It's only just so pity that it's, it's not written by Offenbach. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, the story here. Okay, so just listen uh, over to the... Uh, I'm pretty sure you just... The music. Listen to this. Just a little, just... Excuse this. again waltz. Music is a celebration.
Okay. And once again, you see? So what I would like to uh, uh, to say here, you see, you never, never. Okay, so almost never, you see, unless it's it's opera booth, like in Rossini case, etc. So you never see this this type of music, the bright and, and it's usually in, in opera is dramatic music. Very, you know, collision, very, you know, fighting music. Here's waltzes and all this, that's what the lightness of this. That's what operetta is about. Okay. So what you're what you're telling us, Alexander, he he basically started writing popular music, something that speaks yes. to the people's hearts. Yes. Not uh, not um, uh, tension necessarily, yes. but rather the comical part, the lighter part, something that everybody can love. And and he went against the system, and he basically won, and yes. influenced others. He uh, not against the system. He it's his personality. It's not his just views, etc. His personality. He just he whatever he touched, he made a, a, you know he made a, a setter setter. The life, let's say the next operetta, La Vie Parisienne, Parisienne, the the Parisian life. It's not just a life which he described this. It's just full scale. Uh, one, uh, a first a full scale operette in four acts that portrays contemporary Parisian life, contemporary, unlike earlier pieces on mythological stories based. Mm -hmm. But again, contemporary life in contemporary setting and very Parisian style. You should uh, remember uh, what I said. He came from cafes and varites where he played uh, cello, he played, he played piano, he played this. He just he grew in those in this uh, in this Parisian uh, little cafes, etc. With the music. So another aspect of this music that you were showing us, this beautiful large orchestras, military and community and students and and symphonic orchestras. During his lifetime, the orchestras were much smaller. So I don't know, did he arrange all his music for these large orchestras? Because as far as I remember, like uh, during the Romantic period, the orchestras were like maybe 16 or a little more, just like what we're using uh, at the no, no, no. We're using there them for a yes different purpose no. or because so, we don't have the money to pay for a full orchestra, yeah? No, just it, a joke. it was like that. It was like that, that uh, Romantic, if we're talking about Romantic time, so the orchestra specifically from Berlioz was enlarged dramatically from the Mozart type of orchestra. Uh, or even Beethoven type of orchestra. It was enlarged a lot, but you write in this, because in, in, in the theater, the first, especially when in the beginning, when he worked as a cellist, there was small theaters where this, the, the orchestra pit was small and just could, could uh, carry only maybe 10, 12 people and 16 people, that was okay, that's a, a thing. But then later on in the big theater, when, when he started to work in a big theater, so he wrote this the, for the big orchestra. For the big orchestra, it's not the orchestration, but it's, it's original orchestration for the big orchestras because the big orchestral pits, like, mm -hmm. like in, in opera comic. In opera comic, you have a big pit, pit and, and it's not for 16 or 24 people, that's for, you know, for the big orchestras. Yes, in the beginning, it was like this small, small scale. But then what Oppen Offenbach did in the further his operas, he even re uh, reorchestrate this, his earlier operas to, for, for the bigger scale uh, orchestras. For the Alexander, large, um, large orchestras. We're, we're, we're coming towards, uh, towards the end of, of this talk today. Um, I would like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about uh, about his big and famous opera, if that's okay to, okay, to shift okay. a little bit. Sorry for this. Direction. You know they say yeah, I had this few more uh, few more examples for you of music to to give. 
but that's okay. So uh, among his op uh, apparatus, we have, we, we can meet, uh, you know, like uh, Lagrange, just I will say, Lagrange Duchesse of uh, Gerald Stein, which is, which is the very, very, was, a, you know, a big satire on the, uh, on the anti-militarist uh, anti uh, satire. Okay, and then after this, he started to write more in, in lyrical ways, like, like uh, his operetta, Le Pericol, which more, much more lyrical operetta. Mm -hmm. uh, as for the um, uh, Tales of Hoffman, you know- uh, let, uh, uh, let me stop you for a second before yes. we get into Tales of Hoffman. I'd like to use this opportunity to ask uh, our participants, if you have a question you wanna address Alexander, please use the chat um, a box in the bottom or top of the screen in whichever way you have Zoom set up and write it there and I'm going to present it to Alexander and I have allowed for a, a, a brief a few number of questions in the end of, uh, in the, end of the lecture. Yes, Alexander, please continue. I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you. Uh, in the last year of his life, Offenbach intensively worked on his first and only serious opera, The Big Tales of Hoffman. Uh, he, he worked in this, not just his last year, he, his, this idea came to him maybe 20 years before this, and he started and he let it go. He started and he just quit and started and quit. And eventually in the end of his life, on, in the end of his career, he started to, to write this opera, uh, you know, seriously. And he was in a big hurry. He finished most, uh, mostly the piano vocal score, piano vocal, and began to orchestrate uh, it. But mm. Offenbach died with, with the, with the uh, score in his hands. And just the uh, family friend Ernst, Ernest Giraud uh, just uh, orchestrated the opera and made some uh, uh, significant cuts on demand by the opera comique director who just cared about just the timing. The time it's just opera too big. So, so can I, can I ask you about that for something? Because this, as yes. far as I understand, he started out this opera as a grand opera. And for whatever reason, I have the impression that uh, the producer of the show kind of twisted his arm to make it into a com uh, uh, opera comique. Uh, it's not the opera comique. It's the the, the, the <laughs> it's the theater called opera comique, and I would say that this is very close to to the uh, uh, Bizet's uh, opera um, Carmen, the famous opera Carmen. So, by the way, Ernest Giraud, this the guy who just orchestrated this uh, this opera, the Tales of Hoffman. He also put the recitatives on spoken dialogues to the uh, Bizet opera. As you know, Bizet just died after three months uh, of the uh, after the premiere of the uh, of Carmen. Uh, Carmen was failed, and uh, he wasn't. Uh, uh, I mean, Bizet wasn't a witness of the of this great success of this opera in the, the different uh, different staging. So, uh, and mm -hmm. Giraud just put the spoken dialogues because in version of the Bizet, it was a spoken dialogues in, in Carmen. So Giraud just made, put this music on this, those uh, spoken dialogues, making recitatives and orchestrated uh, opera as well uh, the, um, by uh, often. How about the, the different opera. styles that you can find in this opera? Because you, uh, can, you can have French style and Germanic cannot, style and Wagnerian choral. I would and, like to, to uh, you know, to show you different uh, styles in, in two numbers from this opera that I prepared for you to share. Just different styles here, okay? So one is so-called doll song. Actually, three-act opera. Every act is like different, different uh, uh, in um, just uh, the, the guy, the, the Hoffman, falls in love in, uh, to three different uh, women. One of them in the first act, she was a doll and he didn't know that she is a doll, mechanical doll, but he falls in love with doll. Again, it's a tragically, uh, it's, it's a dramatically ended, and etc. The, the, the second one was the, you know, this very young, etc. And the third one was a prostitute. So they say uh, the courtesan and it, it, we see, you see this so-called the doll aria, 
Yes, from Tales of Hoffman. The, yes, listen yep. to this. And this is very, very popular book. So this is humor. That's what they... Is. He has glasses, uh, magical glasses, magic glasses in his eyes. He needs to, yes, to make again, to, to wind her up again. And she's a... But Colton yes, doesn't see it. Yes. Yep, that's a beautiful one. And the last but not the least, the famous Barcarolle, the mm -hmm. scene from the third from the third act, yes, where they, they, they this, this in, in, in this uh, house, this the where the, the courtesan, he falls in love with Julietta. That's her name. And that's it is angel which protects Hoffman from, from, from dying. Actually, she's she's the love of the muse, not the actual muse. Yeah. 
Yep. Okay. So that's Barcarolle, famous Barcarolle. You know, it, it brought so, back some really nice yeah. memories about a year and a half ago, Alexander, the concert that yeah. you arranged the music for. Uh, that we did at okay, that tip, uh, opera this, operetta, this okay, Lauren Siegel and Nofar Yakobi, how beautifully they sang this. Um, yes. Maybe one it's day when we can get together stopped. again safely, we'll bring it back. Um, yes. You have a question, by the way, from uh, yeah, someone like, in the crowd. But... One okay, so let, okay, let, I'll let you. I'll let you so, uh, Offenbach composed more than 100, uh, that 100 uh, uh, operettas. And he was a specialist at writing music uh, that had rapturous, hysterical quality, simplicity, grace, and beauty. His melodies are usually short and un, uh, uh, unvaried in their basic rhythm with a colorful orchestration. Okay, so that's the, uh, and obviously uh, he uh, parodying many composers using their music their music in the uh, using their music in this uh, in his compositions. Marseillaise, for instance. Yes, many many different different composers and music. He he put this quotes uh, quotations and he just <laughs> and then he made uh, some parodies or some some jokes on this. Like okay. So he he was a very cynical, satiric uh, personality. Yes. Yes. And a phenomenal musical talent who who did not last through conservatory, but yes. he, he is uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. By work the way, one time, control. one time in his life, it made him just made, made it very very dangerous for him because after after the Franco-Prussian uh, war uh, war, he came to Paris and he was under big suspicion as as a you know Parisian. Uh, the secret agent. I don't know this. They say that okay. So you wrote this about this, the the war, etc. So he he was German. I just remind you, and he he lived in Paris. So you know how they they just did this, okay? And he definitely wasn't. And then he wrote the operetta, just uh, another operetta uh, later on, Madame Favar, about the real life of the actress, the uh, the, the French actress, which renewed his reputation, renewed his mm. popularity in France. Otherwise, he was a very big suspicious, and many his operators were bent. bent. Um, we're running out of time, but I have a question here on the chat coming from uh, one of our viewers. Was there a spoken dialogue in operetta, or was everything sung? In operettas, mostly, mostly are spoken dialogues in, uh, in yes. So in very few operators they have recitatives, but the operator usually have. That's another feature of operator. Yes, to say yes, it's a, it's a, it's a like this. And and then you know, actually they, they took from operator they took musical in United States. So they they go they, in states and it's it. The musical came, but it's a little bit different angle of this uh, of the musical. Musical it's a, it's a more more shifting to the to the dance to to this this very very um, intense rhythm of the of the uh, of the um, show so yeah we can we can talk about this maybe in uh, some other time about i guess the, the genre of operetta is a little bit less about, fashionable about in north bernstein. america yes about bernstein if we talk about bernstein so we will yeah but i guess it's a little less fashionable the operetta style in north america but certainly i believe and maybe i'm wrong but i think this is from where it originates. This is that style of music that has, has you know, traveled through the ocean. Actually, uh, Osenbach did have a tour of, uh, of uh, America, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, and we have here, we have here a Toronto Opera, but uh, you know, uh, so many, no, not many people attended this, but this yeah. Toronto Opera, which uh, mostly just stages what? Lehar, Kalman, and, and Strauss. Oh, that's the best. The best. The best. The best yes, but the often best. Bach is some kind of you know like this. Uh, event. But believe yeah. me, this there's a lot of uh, things there. Alexander, thank you so much for tonight's uh, no very, more very very very. Uh, well, this is what I've got through the chat. I've got some comments of congratulations. 
and uh, and really this was so so interesting and brought Thank a new you. light. I hope it was uh, as, um, as useful as entertaining, but just like uh, you know. And I would like to open the appetite for the program on February 18. Yes. Yes. Am I right? In a week. February 18. That's our next uh, installment. George Gershwin, and uh, I'm sure it's a favorite of many. Um, looking forward to, to to talk to you about it and listen to you about uh, interesting facts about Gershwin and, and to hear some phenomenal music. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Alexander. And thank you. Uh, again, thank you, Musica Beth Tikva, for for organizing this and uh, see you at our next program, February 18, George Gershwin. Please sign up. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.